Hi, we're going to be talking to you about Jerusalem artichokes today, also called sunchokes, also fartichokes. Meg's going to take you through a pickling recipe, but before we get to that, I just want to show you what they look like, talk a bit about them and, sh and show you how to harvest them. The great thing about Jerusalem artichokes is that if you're a beginner gardener, you can put them in and basically forget about them. Harvest two thirds of the crop each year, leave a third in the ground or even less, a quarter of, or a fifth of the crop in the ground and you'll have an abundant yield the next year. Let's go into the food forest and have a look at this incredible plant, adaptable plant and drought hardy plant. So these, these lovely things have a beautiful, big, sunny, um, almost like a sunflower, yellow golden flower throughout the summer. They're beautiful. They um, have these canes, which are really great fire starters. So we'll dry some out uh, to use as fire starters, but they also shred up well for the human newer compost or any kind of compost. So um, great resource, great material, beautiful everything about this plant. To harvest them, you just basically grab a, a handful, pull them up like that. Cold climate tubers, you could call them cold climate yams or mild, moderate climate yams or whatever you want to call them. And this is the benefit of a food forest. While it takes uh, a lot of time and effort um, to get yields in annual garden, garden of course, it's, it's very worth it for many crops. You also want to have all those crops that can just keep feeding you and you do very little work. The other thing about these is that you don't have to harvest them all at once. You can actually uh, just keep them in the ground like potatoes and overwinter them and just pull them up as you need. So you might um, roast them, you might mash them. Uh, and But I think after Meg shows you how to pickle them, you'll probably be wanting to do that because they are so good pickled. One more thing about harvesting. If the soil is quite, is not too wet, it's going to be so much easier. If, the, if you've just had a whole lot of rain um, and you've got quite clay soil, uh, the cleaning will take a lot of time. Whereas look at that. It's, we've had a little bit of light autumn rain. The soil moisture is quite good. So the dirt is just falling off them. That's going to be really easy to clean and pickle. Do you think that's enough, Mog? Perfect. So you can see those bits there. Just break them open. They crunch beautifully. And of course you can eat them raw. Okay, even a rinse. I love Jerusalem artichokes. They are such generous plants, but they don't always agree with me. Um, you can have them, people often have them in soups and you can roast them or you can have them raw in salads. When we first started growing them, or when they first started growing themselves in our garden, we would grate them and put lemon juice on them and let it sit for 20 minutes and then eat them, but they still lived up to their nickname, which is fartichokes. Now, I'm not afraid of farting. I don't mind having a musical bottom at all, um, but it's the buildup of gas that when it starts to cause a lot of pain, that's what I don't like. Um, so I figured out that if you ferment them, if you lacto-ferment them, and lacto doesn't have anything to do with lactose in milk, it means um, that it's the lactobacillus, which is the bacteria that does all the work that we're gonna court today into our jar, um, that when they are lacto-fermented or wild-fermented, um, then it takes a lot of the fartiness out of them. So I have, uh, crowded them before so just grate them and put salt on and mush them up and let it sit in a jar they go brown they're delicious 
but they do go quite slimy after not very long, after about a week or so. So if you eat them soon or if you mix them, if you kraut them with cabbage and uh, you can do apple and beetroot and some ginger, it's good. But because of the higher sugar content, um, it doesn't last very long. So I've realized that if you pickle them, and the first year I pickled them, I sliced them quite thinly. They went very mushy very soon. So that's good in terms of the flavor, but it's not in terms of that crunch, that texture that you really want. So I now pickle them whole. So that's what I'm gonna show you today. So it's the sugar that is present in the sunchokes, Jerusalem artichokes, that we, um, our human gut doesn't have the enzyme to digest. So because fermentation is a process of digestion, where the microbes are doing all the work, um, it means that they're much easier for our guts then to uh, digest. And sunchokes are full of really wonderful um, carbohydrate. And it's these carbohydrates and the sugars that um, form the pre that make them a prebiotic. So it's really great food for our microbes then to ingest. So I'm going to take you through a very, very simple pickling recipe that I've been doing for the last, I don't know how many years, and very successfully. Um, yeah, so you saw Patrick give them a rinse. They're not, there's still a little bit of dirt on some of them. I'm not going to be too pedantic. If they're covered in mud and covered in dirt, then I will definitely uh, make sure that they're really much better rinsed, but a little bit of dirt is fine. I'm not afraid of it. Um, and sometimes if they're left in the ground too long, then they can get a bit bruised and go a bit brown. Then I'll just get my knife and I'll just chop those bits out. But these are A grade. Okay, so I'm going to fill my jar halfway with the sunchokes. Yep, about that much. Um, that's where I'm going to put all my spices and things in. So I pickle a lot of things and I love eating pickles and I just love the process of watching things turn from um, plain vegetables into pickled and fermented vegetables. Um, and I use the same spices and the same brine ratio for every single thing that I pickle. Apart from olives, I use a much higher brain, brine ratio. I use 10% and now I'm going to use a 3%. So 3% basically is equivalent to one tablespoon of salt for two cups of water. But I'll, you can watch me do that in a minute. So um, mustard seeds, so I'm just going to put, so this is probably a two litre jar and I'm going to put maybe a tablespoon of these in. Got some dill seeds, if you have fresh dill even better, but these are just some saved seeds. Got some black peppercorns, again about a tablespoon of each of these, maybe a bit less for the pepper. Going to put some bay leaves in. And it's, you can put fresh bay leaves in, but it's much better for the flavours if you put some dried. I'm going to put some, these are some dried lemon peel. So good. Uh, if you've got fresh lemon, great. If you don't have any lemon, that's fine too. And um, a whole hand of garlic, which I peeled earlier. And if you like chilies, then you can put a whole stack in of those. You can put whatever you like in, really. Um, what else would be some nice things? Some star anise might be nice. Maybe some cinnamon, some cardamom pods you could put in there. Okay, so that's halfway. And then I'm gonna put the next half in. Just fill it up. Oops, one on the loose. Grab that later. No, I think this is a perfect amount. So then when these are ready, when we, so Woody just loves them. He just eats them, just crunch, crunch, crunch. But if I'm wanting to put out a lunch platter, then I will uh, cut them into smaller pieces and then we can put them on our sandwiches. Uh, or you could just put them whole when you're making a roast, you could just roast these now once they're pickled and again in a soup or a stew. Um, and you can just zhuzh them up with your hand blender if you wanted to do um, like a pureed kind of soup. Okay, so, oh, it's so pretty. Uh, I'm gonna make my brine now, which is my 3% brine. So I'm gonna do a tablespoon of salt per two cups of water. And I might just make one lot. And then just stir that in. 
So the salt we use is from the pink lake. I'm just going to pour that in. And it's best not to use iodized salt. I'm going to do another lot. Okay, so I'm going to stir it in. Okay. One of the things that we have to remember when we are pickling, um, and there's actually a little song about this, which I will sing you. If it's under the brine, all will be fine. I love brine. And sometimes when I'm crying, <laughs> I think it's all fine. I'm under the brine too. <laughs> I'm self brining. But as long as no solids are poking out of the liquid, you'll be fine. So we actually are just in our outdoor kitchen. So I'm just going to grab one of these grape leaves, these vine leaves. I'm just going to fold it up and stick it in the top, just so it's covering all of the solids. So when we pickle gherkins, um, we need to put in a grape leaf or a leaf that has tannins in it. So it can be a horseradish leaf or a cherry tree leaf or blackberry or raspberry or a tea leaf, things like that, just that contain tannins and oak leaf. So when um, they're pickle when it's, uh, the fermentation process is happening, um, the gherkins stay crunchy for a long time. So that's not why I'm doing it now um, for the sunshakes, but I'm doing it because they call this a follower, something that sits on top of your pickles. And then that's just going to sit on our fermenting table just like that. So I'm going to use that as a bit of a weight or as a weight. So to keep that down and it looks so pretty now and you think, wow, that's really beautiful. So in probably five or so days, the liquid's going to go really, really cloudy as it starts to ferment. And I'm just going to push this down every so often on the fermenting table. Um, and the, as the carbon dioxide is released from the Jerusalem artichokes, I'll see little bubbles come up. And the word ferment actually comes from the Latin, which means to boil. So it's like a cold boil, because as you know, with your sourdough starter or when you're fermenting anything, as the carbon dioxide is released, it looks like it's boiling. Um, and so once this has stopped bubbling, so once the fermentation process is finished, then I'll take this out and I might have to fill up, um, put a bit more brine in there. So when I stick this on the fermenting table, I'll put a plate underneath the jar because sometimes as the, um, the bubbles or the carbon dioxide is released, then um, some of the water will start to spill over so that the plate will catch it. And often I'll have a little jug of brine sitting on the fermenting table and then I'll just top up all my jars if they start to spill over just to make sure all the solids are underneath the liquid. So this will probably be ready to eat maybe depending on the temperature of your house, depending on how many you've got in there, depending on um, what salt you use, all of these different variables, but it'll probably be ready in about a month to six weeks. So once you've eaten them all, which might not take you very long because they're so scrumptious, um, I always keep the brine, I always strain the brine out and stick it in a, a bottle and put in our cellar or you can put it in your fridge and they say that brine is really great hangover cure so you can always use it for that purpose or um, it's just a, a nice digestive tonic um, full of probiotics from the um, from the fermentation process we can put into soups or stews you can add a bit of gin or vodka or um, pear cider that your partner has made in the previous video and so I usually eat the lemons and put those in a soup or stew or just a salad or just munch them after they've been pickled um, and I compost everything else except for the garlic and the garlic I keep um, in a little jar in the fridge and that's really good just to use as uh, for garlic you know, just whenever you need garlic I usually use it for hummus or something like that so once these are finished fermenting they store for about I don't know, it's hard to tell because I always make sure that I hide a jar at the very, very back of all the shelves at the cellar so I can find it six months later or so. But I usually try to make everything last about six months when I pickle them. So if they're, if they're put somewhere really cool, then they can last a whole year. And I do really like that if it's possible to make things last a whole year until we get them next time in the garden. 
um, but yeah probably last about six months. So I've got over here some other um, vegetables that I've pickled. Here I've got some uh, of our gherkins which have been delicious. We did a whole row this year so we've got jars and jars of it to eat and to share. I've got some pickled carrots and again I used to pickle my carrots uh, in slices but they last much longer when they're whole. Good for just munching on um, and if you, when, if you want to eat them sliced then you can just slice them when they're ready. Here I've got some green beans and some leek. Um, here I've got some, one of my favourite things to, uh, to pickle and to kraut a three-cornered three -cornered garlic. And so this year I separated, I pickled the stems and I made kraut out of the stems um, and I pickled the flowers, so just to sprinkle them over. I mean, you can pickle any flowers and they're just so pretty. You can do, I'm just looking around the garden, I've got some calendula flowers um, and some dandelion flowers and borage flowers. You can pickle all of those. They do tend to lose their colour, um, but if you get them just at the right time, they're really nice just to chop up and put in salads or just to have them whole. And here are some uh, borage stalks. So I love pickling. <laughs> I think it's, it's a kind of magic um, to turn something that is abundant in the garden. As Patrick mentioned before, these are drought hardy foods. They're so generous. They just come up in the garden. Um, they're volunteer plants now because they've naturalized in our soils. I never pickle in vinegar. I make a lot of vinegar and I use a lot of vinegar but not with my vegetables. I like to use brine because um, I like to sing my brine song, <laughs> my under the brine song and I know that you will like singing it too. <laughs> um, and I, I like to use brine because um, the fermentation process, um, yes it preserves the vegetables and so does vinegar. It's also unstable. And I like that. Vinegar, you put things in vinegar and they're shelf stable. I like that this is more of an art. I like that you have to embrace uncertainty when you wild ferment. And I think that's a skill that a lot of us uh, need to develop a lot more of. Um, and also because of the probiotic um, content. And I really want to look after myself and my family and my community um, by, you know, good gut health is overall body health. And when we are well in ourselves, then we can do, do good and be good in the world.